I can remember things so vividly. It's like my mind is like, I guess it just stopped at 18, and I remember everything that happened up until then. So you were probably making more money than most kids that you knew? Well, I was making more money than the adults that I knew. I was hired to kill White Boy Rick in the late 80s. Illegal drugs are some of this nation's hottest commodities. I was 17 years old. I, I didn't really, I was in way over my head. I believe it like it's like a sickness. The more, you know, the more you get, the more you want. If you ask people about Rick Wershey, they don't know Rick Wershey. But if you say White Boy Rick, people act like they know who I am and they don't know me. He had the bumper sticker and he had the title, White Boy Rick. From, from my research, he was made out to be much more of a dangerous Scarface kingpin than actually he might have really been. I think about every day if I would have walked away. I was a kid. I was stupid. Hello and welcome. Tonight, an in-depth look at the life and incarceration of Rick Worshey Jr. By now, you've probably heard of and maybe even seen the movie White Boy Rick. That's Hollywood's version of a kid from Detroit who at age 14 started working for the FBI as a paid informant. You know the saying that truth is stranger than fiction. Well, that's definitely the case with Rick's story. To get to the truth, we had to come here to Hampshire Street on Detroit's east side. This is where Rick's childhood home is. This is where he would ride his bike up and down the streets, watching all the drug activity in the neighborhood and then selling it back to the FBI. Let me take you back in time, 34 years. The year was 1984, and around here, that summer was an easy year to remember. The Detroit Tigers won the World Series, getting off to a fast start and never looking back until they had the championship trophy. All the attention on the team took away from a much bigger story in Detroit and around the country, the emergence of crack cocaine into the inner city. Powdered cocaine was popular, but crack cocaine, with its high purity and low cost, took off like wildfire. With a single hit selling for as little as $2.50, more people than ever were taking illegal drugs. It led to rarely before seen crime and violence. Homicide rates doubled to close to 600 per year. The president and his wife called it a crisis. Say yes to your life. And when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. The FBI decided enough was enough, and instead of just letting the DEA go after drug dealers, special task forces were formed using local, state, and federal law enforcement officials. They were told to do what's necessary to put a stop to the crack epidemic. Retired FBI agent John Anthony. We are open to a whole squad that uh, was involved in drugs. It, the Curry case was the one, the main one, the first one that we really became actively involved in. And in that preliminary investigation, white boy Rick's name shows up. And who in the heck is this young kid? I think he was 14 or whatever he was at the time, <clears throat> uh, running around with these uh, African-American gangs. So who was Rick Wershey? At first, he was just a normal kid with a normal upbringing on Detroit's east side. Five was like when my mom left, so, you know, them, the, from, from five to ten was probably real difficult because I had a mom and then I missed her and, you know, I, then I didn't have a mom. I had a grandma and a grandpa and a dad and a sister. So, them, them were difficult years, but probably around ten, I started playing baseball, like, real competitively. competitively. His sister Dawn remembers Hampshire Street as a safe haven. People worked, people had their gardens. I mean, it, it was beautiful. It looked like a suburban, you know, suburban neighborhood would now nowadays. And um, I mean, we, everybody was close. Everybody knew everyone. Everybody knew anyone's, everyone's name. I mean, streetlights came on time to go home. You know, it was, it was, you know, the good times, the good days, but everybody was well behaved. Everybody respected everybody. Rick loved riding his bike and playing baseball. It's hard to imagine how 1984 would change his life, sending him on a path to become one of the most memorable names in Detroit drug gangland lore. Especially since one year earlier, he was living in the suburbs of Frazier with his mom and life 
was looking real good for Rick. When I was 12, you know, I moved out to the suburbs with my mom and got to know her for a year. And to be honest, like 12, from 12 to 13 was probably the best, one of the best years of my life, you know? That was with your mom. Yeah, I lived out there. I met, it was like going to a different world. You know, I moved from the inner city to, to the suburbs and I met my first girlfriend and you know, uh, her family treated me so good, and it was just a different atmosphere, you know what I mean? It's, um, it, it was like, you went from the inner city, and you'd go around, and, you know, my friend's fathers would be smoking weed or drinking beer or this or that, and then I'd go out there, and, you know, they're worried. This is my, my first girlfriend ever, and her parents are worried about me doing my homework, and, you know, just totally different world. It was a world that I had never got to experience until then. And you liked it? Oh, I loved it out there. I didn't want to leave. I, I, I mean, leaving there was probably the hardest thing, you know, that I ever had to do. It was what? like I fell in love with the first girl, you know, my first girlfriend. I would write her when I moved back. We stayed in touch. It was just super hard. Why did you come back? My mom's husband uh, and me didn't get along. He used to hit my mom, and me and him had some problems. And uh, I was up north deer hunting, I think, and he threw all my stuff out of the house. So Rick moved back to live with his dad, who both Rick and Don truly loved. He was wonderful. I mean, you know, he spent a lot of quality time with us. He always was having his own business, doing things, traveling. We traveled every every year for Christmas. Our Christmas gift was $100 in a trip to Florida. Um, he was very close with my grandparents, as were we. They stepped in and helped raise us after my mother left. Um, I mean, he was, he had a good heart. He had good intentions. Did he make all the right choices? Who does? He, he tried to be a real good father, Kev. He, he tried, you know, he took me places. He was one of my baseball coaches. You know, he took me, he took me with him to, to try and teach me business. You know, my dad wasn't, uh, uh, by any means was he, you know, Ward Cleaver or anything like that. But, you know, he, he always tried to teach me from wrong and, and he was a businessman. And Rick Wershe Sr. was a hustler, a guy who loved inventing things. Rick Jr. watched and learned, like father, like son. He too wanted to make money. He had sales skills, I'd say. But I mean, my dad, when my dad would go to the gun shows when we were younger, we would go to a sporting goods store on like south of Six Mile on Van Dyke. And he would buy the whole box of BB guns and say, I paid for them, you guys give me back my money and pay for the table. And whatever you make over that, it's yours. So we learned young, you know, to, to sell things. In the summer of 1984, Rick Sr. found another way to make money, selling information to the FBI. He knew a thing or two about who was breaking the law in Detroit, and the feds were willing to pay for the information. Rick Sr. became an official FBI informant and was given the code name Jem. Yeah, he had worked in a gun shop before on the east side, and the FBI had been in there, agents been in there with guns and whatnot. And it was basically, it's, like, it's just a single dad who's doing the best he can. Yeah, I mean, he, he tried, you know, it, it was, he was always trying to, you know, make a dollar and keep his business going and do this or do that. And he tried the best he could. Was he father of the year? No, he, there was a lot of times we were left, left unsupervised and my grandmother tried to do her best and, but things didn't turn out so well, you know? What you said your name was? Right. The White Boy Rick story is now a major motion picture. Matthew McConaughey is playing the part of Rick Wershey Sr. He says Sr. wanted desperately to be friends with his son and failed as a father. I've never played a character that loses so often, like every time. Like loses every scenario he's in. His heart's in the right place, but he just doesn't, doesn't have the follow through. I know fathers like this, but uh, he's got all the want to, but none of the can do. In the summer of 1984, 
14-year-old Rick Wershey got a job. He was paid to be a snitch. Find out who was selling drugs and tell the FBI all about it. Yeah, I would meet with them at different locations. We would meet on the roof of Kobo or at a restaurant in Kobo or, you know, somewhere else. But we, we always tried to be pretty discreet. But there was times when we met right in the neighborhood. Imagine that, 14 years old, keeping a secret that could get you killed. I think I was too stupid, to be honest with you. Too, too stupid to be scared sometimes. I mean, again, I was a child. I was, I was a kid and... And to be honest with you, I think they brainwashed me. You might be asking yourself, why would the FBI be hiring teenagers to be informants, putting them into a life of guns and drugs? The answer? Because they needed to put a stop to the crack cocaine epidemic. Rick Worshi Jr. was the best there ever was at getting the info police needed to make raids in Detroit. Well, probably if you had to do over again, maybe not because of his age. Uh, and because of what happened to him as a result of it, that's what really bothers me. Uh, but at that time, it was a gold mine, and you just you just couldn't pass it up. You, those opportunities with <clears throat> with Rick and the knowledge he had, you know, how often does that come along? Hardly ever. Hardly ever. And why would a 14-year-old want to work with police? My dad had reached out to the FBI for some help with my sister uh, because she became addicted to drugs. And they came over to the house, some agents. I think my dad had known them from years gone by when he was in the gum business. And they came over and started asking some questions. My dad didn't really know who these people were. And I kind of interjected and told them who they were and recognized them from the neighborhood. They, they showed me some pictures and asked me who this person was, who that person was. I basically identified them and they said they would be in touch and the relationship grew from there. It, it went into them sending me into houses to purchase drugs and stuff like that. Plus, he was getting paid. The Worshies were poor. They went from powdered eggs and powdered milk to a life of steak and caviar. So you were probably making more money than most kids that you, that you knew? Well, I was making more money than the adults that I knew. At 14, Rick Worshi Jr. was rolling in dough. I went shopping, I bought stuff, I bought a car when I was 15 years old. Gym shoes, uh, sweatsuits, jewelry, cars, stuff like that. All with their money. Yeah. Looking back at it today, Dawn and Rick say they are horrified by the idea of police using kids in the war on drugs. Me, as, as a parent now, I never would have had it. I never, my 14 year old kid, are you kidding me? No, but I mean, I, I, I didn't think it was right. I almost lost my life. You know, it, it's, it's troubling that I look back and to be honest, I wonder how anyone could expose a child to that. You know, like my kids or my grandkids, it's something I would never bring a kid into that life. What made Rick so good? He became friends with the Curry family. Johnny was the drug boss on Detroit's east side. We had all got motorcycles together, rode up to see my brother that was in prison in Jackson. We'd go to Skateland, we'd go to Belle Isle, we'd go to nightclubs. Now, Rick was watching everything from the inside. You never suspected that he was meeting no. with police. You know what, I didn't suspect that he was meeting with police. And I never expected that, because he was so young. And then telling the FBI in exchange for money. It was stressful, I'm not gonna tell you it wasn't. There, there was, you know, you, you always keep in mind, like you said, you're a 14 or 15 year old kid, and you have to be conscious never to slip. I mean, one wrong word, one wrong, you know, thing, and you put your life in danger. One wrong move, one person finds out about Rick's secret, and it could be lights out. Trust me, I, I, I knew all about what happens to an informant in, in that world. What, what happens? If the right people find out, you're going to be murdered. You weren't just shot. I mean, you were injured severely. Oh, yeah. I was I was on death's door. I was asking him to call 911. He wouldn't call 911. The uh, ambulance driver told Rick, you're going to die. The real story of white boy Rick. 20 brand new in-depth interviews, including the Worshi family. I can remember things so vividly.
Shattered presents White Boy Rick, a new podcast. Subscribe today. Rick is now 15 years old and skipping school during the day. At night, he's hanging out at the clubs for the FBI. I would go to like one of the the clubs in the neighborhood or the after hours or whatever. Like the lady was on Jefferson and Van Dyke. Or the climax was Mount Elliott and Jefferson. Stokes after hours on Shane in Detroit. The police are working around the clock too, conducting drug raids based on Rick's information. <laughs> confiscating hundreds of weapons, kilos of cocaine, and millions of dollars. The biggest busts are on the east side where the Curry brothers operate. He was the most productive narcotic informant that the FBI had during that period of time. Nobody else could touch him in terms of information. He was a gold mine for information. When the police keep raiding crack houses, the Currys don't think it's simply bad luck for them or great work by the police. Rick says the Currys suspect there's a rat in the organization and they want it exterminated. Can you tell me about the day you got shot? I skipped school that day, and I think I think I went to the McDonald's on Harper and Cadu. I got something to eat, and then uh, uh, an associate of mine and, and the Currys had invited me over to his house. And I went over to his house, and he called me upstairs, and five minutes later, he shot me in the stomach. And then what happened? All I remember from that point was I was asking him to call 911. He wouldn't call 911. Uh, his girlfriend showed up, thank God, and she started in a panic, like, what happened? What'd you do? And I think she was the one that called 911, to be honest with you. She saved my life. On the way to the hospital, the ambulance driver told Rick, you're going to die. You know, I guess so he could say his last Last whatever prayer to who, who, whoever you want to pray to. Oh well, yeah, I was, I was on death's door. I mean, the doctor, Dr. Norman Bowles saved my life. There's no bones about it. He, he stayed with me for probably a half of a day. He never left my side. And I'll never forget the speech that he gave me, you know. He came in, he closed the door, and he said, listen, I don't know what the hell you're into. He said, but you're 15 years old. He said, and there's a whole bunch of FBI agents running around. He said, they have you in here under John Doe, and I'm assuming someone tried to kill you because you're shot. He said, whatever you're into, son, you need to stop because you almost died. I remember um, a lot of people coming and going, people I didn't know, you know, plain clothes, police officers, my dad, and myself. And, you know, a lot of, you know, you gotta leave the room, a lot of whispering, a lot of pointing. You know, which obviously at that time was FBI and and police that were not in uniforms to, uh, I guess, protect Rick, I would assume, because they assumed that it was a hit. Uh, I was surrounded by police and agents and everyone wanted to know what happened. and and. I think I played stupid at first and said I didn't know what happened, but I I knew what happened. Do you? I mean, you you think it was you think it was someone sending a message, not an accident? I mean, people say it was, and people say it wasn't. I, I don't know how it's an accident to shoot someone in the stomach the way I was shot, but I was told to say it was an accident, and I said it was an accident. Rick says his dad was furious with the FBI and he wanted all contact with his son to stop. He, he got in a fight with him in the hospital. My dad knew, he, he never, he, he knew that I was meeting with him, but he never knew how deep they got me involved. That was the only time where, where it got really sticky, and it was a time when we thought, we, hey, this is over with. That's not what happened. You know, if he's willing to take a bullet and still go, you know, his stature and that courage, whoop, way up. When you get shot in the streets and you keep your mouth shut, it gives you street cred. You don't, it, you run to the police in the city and then no one wants to do anything. Here I was a kid, I got, I took a bullet and kept my mouth shut, every, you know, so everyone was like, man, this kid's legit. So, so did you become like closer with the Currys then after? 
Yeah, absolutely. I started traveling with them. Las Vegas, Nevada, 1985. Caesars Palace. Tommy the Hitman Hearns versus Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Watching Thomas Hearns stick and move the air. Seeing the Hitman remain cool as the night breeze as Marvin Hagler and his troop pepper him with insults. For boxing fans, this was a hot ticket. For drug dealers, this was a must-be-seen-at event. Especially drug dealers from Detroit, who loved hometown hero Tommy Hearns. When the feds found out Johnny Curry was going to Vegas, they wanted Rick Worshey right by his side. They never hesitated, spending $15,000 to send the 15-year-old to Vegas to get more evidence against the Curry organization. I was given a fake ID. I was 15 at the time. The ID made me 21 years old. I had a pocket full of money, and I was on the Vegas Strip. And I was 15 years old, and I could do whatever I wanted. You were at the Pink Flamingo, right? You remember looking out the window? What did you see? I looked across at Caesar's Palace and I thought about Eva Beneva jumping the fountain. I was like, wow, I'm here. A 15 year old in Vegas on the government's dime. Dawn Worshey says her father didn't like it and he sent her to watch Rick's back. My dad said, I want you to go to Vegas with your brother. I'm going to pay your way. I had no idea that he was going to watch the Curry brothers or keep an eye out or get information. Johnny Curry had no idea either. I said, at that time, I still didn't know Rick was telling. I thought he just came down. I didn't think that the feds had sent him down. The fight was a classic. Those who paid to see it got their money's worth. So did the FBI. They were about to use Rick's information to take down Detroit's first family of cocaine, the Currys. Operation Backbone uh, was an effort on part of the FBI to identify uh, law enforcement corruption. I got three Detroit police officers myself. That's okay, cool. all right. Okay. And these people have been with me. Okay, you can trust them. You can give us a heads up on any police that are in the area. Okay. Okay, number one. Okay. And number two, so we don't get ripped off. News 4 at 5 with Mort Grimm and Carmen Harlan. 20 people, including a dozen members of the Curry family, were arrested. When faced with the mountain of evidence against them, they all pleaded guilty in exchange for no more than 15 years behind bars. Much of the information for the arrest came directly from 15-year-old Rick Worshey Jr. Do you remember how the task force ended its relationship with you? Yeah, I remember. They just, one day, my pager never went off again. They just stopped talking to me. The government, as opposed to thanking him, giving him a medal, saying, okay, now we're going to send you back to school and we're going to send you to a private school and we expect you to do well and graduate, they just stopped calling him. Rick had a taste of the good life, cars, clothes, jewelry, and women, all thanks to the money he made while working for law enforcement as a snitch. Now that they and their money was gone, where she had to choose, school or the streets. It was an easy choice. Rick chose the streets and became a drug dealer. And giving him instant credibility, his new girlfriend, one of the Motor City's most powerful women. Chris Hansen was a crime reporter in Detroit at the time. So I got a tip that the FBI was gonna raid Kathy Bolson Curry's townhouse, um, just on the outskirts of downtown Detroit. And um, we raced over there, it was a Friday afternoon. And I remember getting there and finding out that white boy Rick was in bed with Kathy Bolson Curry. She was a nice lady. It was, uh, she was a good girl. She wasn't hard to look at, you know. People make a big deal out of uh, him hooking up with Kathy after you were gone. How do you look at all that? Listen, like I told him at the premiere, the light goes on. You left tomorrow, today, your wife, whatever. You still got to keep moving and live life, enjoy life every moment that you can. So that wasn't a big issue about because he started messing around my wife. Come on. Do you think that her connections then were possibly an encouragement for you to to re rev it up and selling drugs? I mean, of course you're that age and you look at the power that Johnny had and you look at the pull that she had and you and you think that I thought that I could you know use that to my advantage. Kathy Volson had access to police information on who they were investigating and when raids would go down. 
Rick figured he could deal drugs with little chance of getting caught. I was overwhelmed with the, the, the cars and the money and the jewelry. It, it was just, it was too much. I was a kid that never had nothing. I believe the money, the drug dealing, it, it, I believe it like is like a sickness. The more, you know, the more you get, the more you want. Rick hooked up with a big time supplier named Art Derrick to move cocaine from Miami to Detroit. I think he bought two planes from the Rolling Stones. I'll never forget taking off from City Airport and I flew over. My grandparents are in a, a mausoleum at City Airport and we flew over and I told them, I said, my grandpa's buried in there. I wish he could see me now, you know? And looking back, if my grandpa could have saw me then, he probably would have slapped the out of me. Rick wasn't a kingpin, but he was a weight man, a wholesaler who made a lot of money and a lot of enemies. I was hired to kill Washi Jr., better known as White Boy Rick. Nate Boone Craft admits to killing more than 30 people as a Detroit hitman. Rick Worshi was the one that got away. Music got pretty loud, and God willing, I saw the slide door on the van opening, and I told my buddy, I said, pull off, and he didn't hear me. And I reached my leg over the thing, and I pushed on the gas, and we went through the red light. And that's when the shots rang out. Of course we hit the car, but hitting the car ain't the whole routine. You must get the person that we going to. Don't kill a car. Kill that person in the car. That's who we come to kill. But the white boy jumped down up in there, and I could have swore that it went across his back when the gun finally jammed. Nate didn't get Rick, but the Detroit police did in May of 1987. They pulled him over in a traffic stop. Rick had 30 grand in cash in the car. It was two houses from my grandparents where they pulled him over. And I think my dad was at my grandma's if he wasn't at his house. No, he was at grandma's and we saw like this whole thing unfold. If we would have just gave them the money, Kevin, they would have went away. That's when my dad ran over there and looked in the car and saw the bag of money, grabbed the bag of money out of the front seat off the floor and ran to my grandma's with it. I just took off through the back, through the side of the houses, through the melee. I, I was just going to wait for it to die down and go back. They chase him down. They pistol whip him. They bring him, throw him over the fence. I mean, they beat him up, and they arrested him. Rick was charged with possession of eight kilos. That's 8,000 grams. In Michigan, there was a law at the time. Anyone caught with 650 grams or more would spend the rest of their life in prison if convicted. When I was convicted, I said, I'll never give up, and I'm never going to let him win. I'll never let him. You, you, have, you have my body, but you don't have my mind. In 1987, Rick Worshi was sentenced to life in prison without parole. He was 18 years old. For the next four years, he did his best to settle in to his new life. Do you have a best part of the day and the worst part of the day in jail? The worst part's when you wake up, the best part's when you go to sleep because you've done another day. In 1991, the FBI paid a visit to Worshi in prison. They had a plan to catch corrupt cops in Detroit and see if it would lead all the way to the mayor's office. They wanted Rick to call his old girlfriend, the mayor's niece, Kathy Volson Curry, and tell her he had a drug dealer friend from Miami who needed dirty cops in Detroit to make sure the shipments made it safely. Rick called his attorney for my advice. He said, Mr. Masali, you've always been honest with me and my family. I'm going to ask you a question. And he said, he gave me the circumstances. He said, should I cooperate with them? Should I help them? And I said, Rick, Based on what I've seen, get it in writing. Find out exactly what they're promising you or don't talk to them. And he said, thanks. And I didn't hear from him again. Well, apparently they talked him into helping them and they didn't put it in writing. Kathy Volson was in, so was her dad, Willie, and friend Jimmy. The two men flew to Miami to close a deal. So we're ready to talk a little bit. History, Operation Backbone. Sitting on the couch, Willie Volson, the brother-in-law of then Mayor Coleman A. Young. Sitting next to him, Detroit police officer Jimmy Harris, Mayor Young's bodyguard at the time. I got three Detroit police officers myself. That's okay, all right, okay. And these people have been with me 
Okay, you can trust them. The two men are on a yacht in Miami. They think it belongs to this international drug dealer, Mike Diaz. It does not. It belongs to the FBI, and Diaz is really an undercover agent named Mike Castro. For uh, a successful mission and uh, a good escape and all that, uh, uh, 40, 50 grand. Diaz is offering the men $50,000 to put together a team of dirty cops to protect 100 kilo cocaine shipments from Miami to Detroit City Airport. So basically, we're businessmen, we're in the, we're in the drug business. You can give us a heads up on any police that are in the area. Okay. Okay. Number one. Okay. And number two, so we don't get ripped off. Officer Jimmy Harris and Willie Volson are all in. So we got a deal? Yeah. yeah. Operation Backbone uh, was an effort on part of the FBI to identify uh, law enforcement corruption. And it just took off like a snowball downhill. And here we are a year or two later, we got 12 police officers. Who was behind the sting? One man, white boy Rick Worshey. The FBI came to him in prison for help. He agreed, hoping it would help him get out early. Were you surprised or did you know they would do it? They'd go for it. I, there was no doubt in my mind. I just told you that I knew, I knew that if money was involved, that they would take the money. To make it work, Rick had to call his former girlfriend, Kathy Volson Curry, the niece of Mayor Coleman Young. Rick told her Mike Diaz was one of his closest friends in the drug world and could be trusted. They said Diaz was also Don Worshey's boyfriend. They all met for dinner at the Whitney in Detroit to discuss making money on the shipment of cocaine into Detroit. I thought everything went well. She was at ease. I mean, I don't think she had a care in the world thinking anything other than what we told her. She wanted in? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kathy Volson believed the Worshies, and Willie Volson and Jimmy Harris believed Kathy. Harrison Volson collected over $200,000 in bribe money to protect drug shipments. In 1991, they were busted. Volson, Harris, and 10 other cops were sent to prison. Did you think they'd be able to pull it off? I knew we could pull it off. There was no doubt in my mind. I knew how greedy they were. The FBI says they never could have done it without Rick Worshey. He was the best FBI drug informant that we ever had. Worshi has been locked up for over 30 years for committing two nonviolent crimes. One, possession of eight kilos of cocaine in 1987. The other, participating in a stolen car ring from behind bars in 2006. His scheduled release date, December 2020. Where the f you been, Tony? People don't have to believe me. People could say, oh, who was this, who was that? He was a corrupt cop who took bribes. Operation Backbone was big news. In many cases, federal authorities say the officers used unmarked police cars and wore their uniforms. The transactions were recorded on video by the feds. Nearly a dozen police officers went to prison. Rick was thrilled about it and wasted no time bragging on TV with then WDIV reporter Chris Hansen. I just proved that what I say is the truth. You proved it by what happened a few weeks ago. That's right. That those police are still involved and they haven't even scratched the surface. Those seven or ten police, that's nothing. There's the corruption runs so deep in there, it's it's a shame, man. One cop that got away in Operation Backbone was Gil Hill. He was offered bribe money and refused to take it. During the FBI investigation, Hill met with Harris, a longtime friend, Bolson, and the undercover agent posing as the drug dealer. But Hill refused to get involved. He says the entire probe smacks of entrapment. It seems like this upset you tremendously, tremendously. While Hill would not get into great detail, he promised he would do so soon. I intend to address this with a full statement tomorrow. Still unclear is whether or not Councilman Hill tried to notify anyone that he was approached to help launder drug money. No one with either the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office was available for comment on this latest revelation. At the Federal Building in downtown Detroit, I'm Chris Hansen, Nightbeat. You may have heard the name Gil Hill before. Not only was he a top boss in the Detroit Police Department, he also played one in the movies as Eddie Murphy's boss, Inspector Todd, in Beverly Hills Cop 1, 2, and 3. Inspector T, how you doing? Where the f 
you been, Foley? Rick Worshey told the FBI that Gil Hill took a bribe back in 1985 to cover up a murder. Kevin, truthfully, I wish I never would have got roped into the Damian Lucas thing because I didn't know 30 years later it would still be affecting my life. Twelve-year-old Damian Lucas was accidentally killed in a drive-by shooting. Rick says he was in a car with drug dealer Johnny Curry and heard Gil Hill on speakerphone say he would take care of everything. Rick reported it to the FBI task force, who was paying him for information at the time. Johnny placed a call to Gil, put it on speaker. We were riding around, and basically Gil told him everything that was going on and, you know, that he had it under control and that he would be in touch not to worry about, any, about anything. The FBI says they interviewed Johnny Curry, and he admitted to paying off Gil Hill. Johnny Curry says it never happened. I don't know. I have no knowledge of that. Gil Hill died in 2016, so there's no way for him to defend himself from these allegations. The Damian Lucas case remains unsolved. People don't have to believe me. People could say, oh, Gil was this, Gil was that. Gil was a corrupt cop who took bribes. Although Gil Hill was never charged, his association to corruption was damaging to his public image, and he blamed Rick, who had been feeding the FBI information. Rick isn't the only one who accused Gil Hill of wrongdoing. Remember that hitman, Nate Boone Craft? He told us Gil Hill hired him to kill Rick Wershey. His exact word was, we want this boy taken care of. I said, well, ain't no problem as long as you got the money. He said, I got half. I said, that would that be a start. So you want me to kill the boy? He said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I believe Gil wanted me dead. I believe Gil knew that I was the informant on the Damian Lucas murder, and I believe that Gil wanted me dead. Gil Hill went on to become a Detroit City Council president. In 2001, he unsuccessfully ran for mayor against Kwame Kilpatrick. Rick thinks if he never ratted on Gil Hill, things could have been different for him. I embarrassed a lot of people. I, got, I put egg on a lot of people's faces down there. But all I did was what I was asked, and all I did was tell the truth. And he had good intentions when he testified in 2000. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, he said, I sing in front of thousands, and here I sit in front of 100, and I don't know what to say, you know? And, I mean, he, he, he went out of his way, out of his way to help Rick. Let me take you back to the morning of March 27, 2003. I'm signing into a logbook here at the federal courthouse in Detroit. Rick has been in prison for 15 years, but now the 650 Lifer Law in Michigan has been overturned. That means Rick now has the possibility of parole, and it all comes down to what happens inside this courthouse. The hearing began at 10 a.m., and everyone was buzzing about the appearance of Kid Rock. Got more cash than white boy Rick. The controversial Detroit rapper here to testify Obviously, in favor of in releasing Rick Worshey from prison. I sing in front of thousands, and here I sit in front of a hundred, and I don't know what to say, you know? And, I mean... Do you think that ended up helping you or hurting you, or had no, no difference? agents called Rick a hero for his help in bringing down dirty cops and drug dealers. But the board was more persuaded by a letter from then prosecutor Mike Duggan saying Worshi was very dangerous and committed violent crimes as a juvenile. Whoever wrote that letter lied. Rick's official juvenile record includes a charge of carrying a concealed weapon, but no violent crimes. 
Next, a DEA agent said Rick put a hit on a guy, and Detroit cops said he was very dangerous. One of those officers is Bill Rice, who now tells us he didn't know where she and was given sealed grand jury testimony and ordered to testify against him. You felt like you were ordered to go? Absolutely. Worshi's parole was denied. He returned to federal prison in Florida. There, he met a guy who could help his sister Dawn make some money. At one time, a car hauler would pull up at my house on 12 Mile in Jefferson and drop off 10 cars because we had a large yard. And I mean, it looked like a car lot in our yard, but they all fit back there. Rick's mom even bought one of the cars. But as it turns out, some of those Florida cars were stolen. The guy that was the ringleader was in prison with Rick. He was operating this out of a federal prison. Well, Rick called his mother and sister and said, hey, these are great deals. Rick was charged in 2006 with conspiracy. I was told you take a plea bargain or I'm going to arrest your mom and your sister. So what do I do? I took a plea bargain against my attorney's wishes. He was sentenced to five years, and that's on top of his life sentence in Michigan. Fifteen long years would pass before Worshi would get another parole hearing. I said, I'll never give up and I'm never going to let him win. I'll never let him. You, you, have, you have my body, but you don't have my mind. And, you know, I, I try and so much, you know, stay in a better place. You know, I'm not going to lie. There's times, you know, that I, I get down or I get depressed or... I miss my kids and my family. You miss a lot spending 30 years in prison. One of the toughest for Rick was the death of his father in 2014. I don't think Rick could have handled seeing what my father looked like when he died because he would have walked past him in a store and not known that that was our dad. It was, you know, it disfigured him horribly, horribly. And I actually asked Rick, when my dad was dying, do you want me to put him, you know, I know I can get him in a car at this point. This is before it got really bad and bring him up there. And he said, no, but I understand he wanted, remember. he wanted to remember him the way he was. He was in severe pain. I would call sometimes and, you know, I would have to get off the phone because I couldn't stand to hear him moaning. The last conversation, you know, I had with him was he told me he was going to miss me. And I said, I'm going to miss you too. And that was, you know, that's what I'll take to my grave. What do you miss the most? His voice. The next year, Rick gets hope again. Judge Dana Hathaway announces she will resentence Worshi. The People versus Richard Worshi, this matters before the court for a motion hearing. The hope is quickly dashed when prosecutor Kim Worthy files an appeal, saying the judge has no authority to release Worshi. The Court of Appeals sides with the prosecutor. On February 29, 2016, Gil Hill dies. He was the homicide cop Rick Worshi snitched on. The person Rick believed was fighting the hardest from behind the scenes to keep him in prison. I think it goes back to Gil Hill. All, all roads lead back to him. Then suddenly, in August of 2016, six months after Gil Hill's death, Tonight, Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy, one of the most outspoken people who worked to keep him behind bars, now says it may be time to rethink her position. Having been deeply immersed in the juvenile life without parole murder cases for the last six months, I have noted parallels to the Richard Worshi case that have caused me to review the Wayne County Prosecutor's position on his case. I asked Kim Worthy if her decision had anything to do with her close professional friendship with Gil Hill. We never even talked about the case. I never made any promises to him about anything. And even if he was my best friend, I would never do that for anyone. The day you start compromising your cases, your beliefs, when you have a job like this, is the day you need to quit. And I would never, ever do that. In April 2017, the parole board says Worshi will finally get another hearing. A uh, lot of sleepless nights. I mean... I guess at best I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. It's it's a big day. I mean, 30 years in a cage and I have a chance to get my life back. And it's nerve-wracking to say the least. In June, the hearing takes place. 
and in July, a decision comes in. I was with Rick's family as the announcement was made. Then my phone rang. It was Rick, right after he heard the news. I love you, and I, I couldn't be more happy and excited to finally have you home with us. I love you too, Gab, and I can't wait to see you, and I can't wait to hold the baby and give her a big kiss. Yeah, we love you, okay? Yep, tell everybody I said hi, and I love them. Tell Nana I said I love her, and tell everyone that, you know, I'm, I'm coming home. Yeah. In a unanimous vote, the parole board released Rick Wershey from his life sentence in Michigan. But Rick did not come home. He was taken directly to Florida to serve his five-year sentence for taking part in that stolen car ring. He hopes the Florida Clemency Board will consider him for early release. But as of today, his official out date is Christmas Day 2020. He tells me the cocky teenage drug dealer white boy Rick is dead, died off decades ago behind prison walls. Today, he says, he's simply a middle-aged man looking forward to making the best of the rest of his life. And if by chance you come across him, you can just call him Rick. I'm not white boy Rick. I'm Rick. I'm not, I'm not the person I was made out to be. I did some bad things, but it was a life that I was pushed into. And the second half of my life, I'm going to do some good with it and... The people that have fought so hard for me, I'm not going to let them down. Rick says there's nothing he would like more than to come home. He could never realize how much has changed in the past three decades. In fact, his childhood home is no longer here. It was demolished years ago. Much of Rick's life has also been demolished by FBI agents who used him as a 14-year-old for information and by his own bad choices to sell drugs and steal cars. Rick sees his life in two chapters. The first we showed you tonight. The second begins the day he gets out of prison and starts living the rest of his life. Thank you for watching and good night.